Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion, and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mark Snyder from BioRad Laboratories. Thank you, Leah, and uh, thank you all for joining us either this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending upon where you live. So we're going to talk today about process scale column packing of our CHT ceramic hydroxyamatite media, and I hope to be able to convince you that uh, it's actually just about the easiest resin to pack. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is CHT? For those of you who don't know, um, CHT is a mixed mode, incompressible chromatography media, and I'll come back to this point later on as well. It, it, work, it interacts with proteins via two mechanisms classical cation exchange, as well as metal affinity, and in this case we're talking specifically about calcium affinity interactions. So those of you that have used any sort of IMAC resin, it's like IMAC, but it's with calcium instead of zinc or copper or nickel or what have you. We have two types, type 1 and type 2, two particle sizes, 40 to 80 micron, and CHT is used in the purification of a wide variety of different biomolecules, probably the largest use is in antibodies, either monoclonal or polyclonal or even bispecific. It's also used to purify antibody fragments, recombinant proteins, isozymes, viruses, viral particles, vaccines. It's particularly good at viral clearance if you're trying to get rid of viruses. And you can also use it to separate the various forms of, of uh, nucleic acids. So a few packing basics. First is that the, the tap settle density is 0.63 grams per mil. This means that if you weigh out carefully one gram of CHT and put it into a graduated cylinder and tap the cylinder until all the particles have settled into their maximum packing density, you get a volume of about, points, of about um, 0.63 grams per mil. So this is how it works out. 0.63 grams of powder will pack to one mil bed volume, which means that if you buy a kilogram of CHT, you're actually getting a lot more than one liter of packed resin. However, for most indications, it's not possible to achieve this tight packing density because most of you don't have uh, big vibrating motors on the sides of your columns. So we recommend when you calculate how much you need, a packing density of about 0 0.60 grams per mil. We suggest this for columns that are 20 centimeters or larger in diameter. Bed consolidation can be either flow or axial packing, and it just has to be faster than the fastest settling particle for best results. And I'll come back to this in just a moment. Since CHT is incompressible, once all the particles settle to the bottom of the column, the column is packed. You don't need to bring the head down and try to compress the bed, because if you do that, you'll just start breaking particles. Now I mentioned you have to go, you have to flow faster than the fastest settling particle. And for 40 micron particles, the fastest settling particle is about 125 centimeters an hour. That means that if you put a particle at the top of 100, the smallest particle at the top of 125 centimeter tall column of water in an hour, it'll make it all the way to the bottom. So this means that for 40 micron material, you want to pack at a flow rate of 150 centimeters an hour. It doesn't do you any good to pack any faster. You can pack at 300 centimeters an hour if you want, but you don't gain anything in terms of bed characteristics. For 80 micron particles, however, you will have to go to 300 centimeters an hour because the fastest settling particle is quite a bit faster, as you see. So there are really four steps to pack your CHT column. You make the slurry, you transfer the slurry into the column. If, it's not, if you're not making the slurry in the column, you pack and then you qualify, much like all other resins. So what you want to do is calculate the amount of dry powder that you need. And again, the, the true tap settle density is 0.63, but we recommend using 0.60 kilograms per liter or grams per mil. You want to add the CHT powder to buffer, not the reverse, because what we found is that if you, if you do it in the reverse, it's very, very hard 
to resuspend all of the CHT in a, in a reasonable amount of time. We recommend that the packing buffer have an ionic strength at least that of PBS, so something on the order of 15 millisiemens per centimeter. Um, many people use 200 to 400 millimolar phosphate at a neutral pH. This is a typical formula here for PBS, so less phosphate and 150 millimolar sodium chloride. People have also packed in one normal sodium hydroxide. That's also fine. In terms of the amount of buffer you have to use, CHT will absorb about 90% of its volume during its initial hydration. So as, a, as an example, if you're going to make one liter of a 50% slurry, and this is going to make about 500 mils of packed bed, you would need 315 grams of CHT, and then you'd want to add about 950 mils of buffer. We do not recommend using slurry concentrations greater than 50%. The reason for this is if you make a slurry that's above 50%, it begins to resemble oatmeal, which means it's rather hard to keep it in a homogeneous form in the slurry tank. It's rather difficult to pump, and you can actually cause some damage to CHT if you have this high a concentration. In terms of mixing the slurry, either mix manually with a plastic paddle using a J-stroke. Um, you want to avoid simple circular agitation because if you do this, you'll get a mound of CHT in the bottom frequently. If you, if you think in your minds about mixing up, if you dump a lot of salt into a glass at home and you, you stir it round and round, when you stop, you'll see this mound of undissolved salt in the middle. That's kind of what you would get if you use a simple circular motion. If you are going to use a motorized stirrer, make sure that you have a low shear impeller. And what I've shown here is a picture of a typical hydrofoil low shear impeller. The reason for this is because CHT particles, while they can withstand a lot of pressure, mechanically they're vulnerable to shear. So if you use the typical kind of impeller that's found in most buffer tanks where high shear is required, what you'll do is just damage a lot of CHT particles and you'll end up with a column that's very, very hard to flow. So please make sure to use a low shear impeller. We can recommend various impeller manufacturers and model numbers. If you want, please feel free to call us. If you're transferring the slurry from, uh, from a slurry tank into a column, only use a diaphragm pump. Do not use peristaltic or rotary lobe systems. Again, the reason is because peristaltic and rotary lobe systems will shear the CHT particles as they're being transferred. If you use a peristaltic pump, you'll just end up with a lot of sheared particles in the, in the column. If you use a rotary lobe system, you'll probably score the inside of the pump as well as damaging CHT, and you certainly don't want to do that. You can also transfer via syringe. Syringe transfer is now a fairly popular way. This is where you bring the column top adapter down to the bottom of the column, seal it up, and then pull the adapter up using the column as a big syringe to transfer in from a slurry tank. This works very well. Just make sure that you don't introduce air as you're pulling in that last bit of CHT. You want to make sure that the column is level. This is important for packing CHT in particular, um, and I'll come back to why that is a little later on. If you are packing 40 micron CHT, the column frit should be 10 microns or less. The reason for this is that CHT, which has a nominal particle size of 40 microns, actually has particles, some particles, that are smaller than that. And if you use a column frit of 20 or 22 microns, which is fairly typical for most shipped columns, you'll find that these small particles can plug up the bottom of the column and lead to flow irregularities. So now that you've got the, the slurry into the column, it's time to pack. So in an open column, um, after it's sealed up or with syringe transfer, once it's complete, you want to start proceeding to bed consolidation right away. Um, typically, it will take a um, not very many minutes to pack the whole column. You want to pack again at a flow rate of 150 centimeters an hour for 40 micron material, 300 centimeters an hour for, for 80 micron material, and you can use either flow or piston movement or flow plus piston movement. It doesn't really matter. 
You do that until all the particles are down at the bottom of the bed. Since CHT is not compressible, the bed doesn't rebound. This means that once all the particles are down to the bottom of the bed, you are done packing. At that point, lower the head plate until it's just above the top of the packed bed. You want to leave a gap of one to five millimeters. Don't press the head plate into the bed, again, because these particles are incompressible and you'll just start crushing them. So I want to pause here and make a, a couple of comments. People will ask me, well, what if I bring the top flow adapter down to just until it's kissing the top of the bed? The answer is that's fine. Um, you know, if you break one or two particles, that's okay. If you break 100 particles, that's okay. If you break a million particles, that's going to be a problem. Where that break point is when you're just bringing it down to the very top of the bed, I don't know. So we recommend leaving a gap of one to five millimeters, and that's shown in this picture right here. Here's the top of the bed. Here's the top of the flow adapter, and this is now about a half centimeter above. This is also why I said earlier that it's important to have the column level, because if you're looking at this side of the bed and you've got a five millimeter gap and the column is not level, on the other side of the bed, maybe you've already pressed the top flow adapter down into those particles. So you really want to have a level column. This isn't an issue with compressible resins, but it is with CHT and other incompressible resins like silica or controlled pore glass or zirconium or what have you. So now you're all set to do asymmetry and HTTP testing. You can do it two ways. Many people use conductivity. In this case, you want to equilibrate the column with phosphate buffered saline or something similar. Then you inject with phosphate buffered saline plus up to one millimeter, uh, one, mil, one molar sodium chloride of one molar sodium chloride, typically one to two percent of the bed volume. You always want to use the same level of phosphate in the equilibration and the injection buffers. We found that if you don't do that, you can get some funny looking peaks out the other end. If you don't want to use conductivity, people have used um, UV, typically acetone. Some people use vitamin B12. Some people use caffeine. I've seen all of them. Doesn't really matter, with one exception, which I'll come to in just a minute. We also have some people who pack, as I indicated earlier, in one normal uh, sodium hydroxide. They'll then flush with 0.1 normal sodium hydroxide and use one normal as a tracer. I've also seen people use a one normal sodium hydroxide background buffer, inject 0.1 normal, and then you have an inverted conductivity peak. It's really up to you. So a few notes now about asymmetry testing. We have what you would call typical or nominal um, values in our literature, as do all the other, other vendors. Please, when you're looking at these numbers, these are for reference only. This is what you might be able to get under an ideal packing, but maybe even under a typical packing. The issue is that you should decide what asymmetry and HTTP values you need for your process. Don't go by, by, by what we say because you may be making it more difficult for your manufacturing floor than is necessary. You can pack CHT to 12,000 plates per meter. I've seen it done, but do you need 12,000 plates per meter? Probably not. Again, the test solution should have the same phosphate concentration as the running buffer. A well-packed column will often produce two peaks, and this is the one additional note that I was mentioning a minute ago. If you were using sodium chloride as a tracer, you will often see a second peak, and that's indicated down here by the red arrow. You see that very small peak. This is due to background phosphate interactions with the column as the sodium chloride peak is coming down, and it is normal. Probably 90% of the time you will see this peak. So don't worry about it um, if you see it. You shouldn't see this peak with acetone or sodium hydroxide. That's why I said that there's one difference between UV testing and conductivity testing. And again, acceptance criteria should be based on required performance, on your required performance. Again, if you don't need 12,000 plates per meter, please don't ask your manufacturing floor to pack to that. If you don't need 1.5 asymmetries, please don't ask them to pack to that. So a couple of post-packing considerations. Again, CHT is incompressible. The beads are not elastically forced against each other, and as a result, the bed can continue to consolidate 
somewhat after initial packing. If you think of a box of cornflakes, if you look on just about any cereal box, you'll see it says on the side, this box is sold by weight, not by volume. Some settling may have occurred in transit. This is exactly what you can see with CHT. After packing, if you move the column around, or even sometimes with just starting and stopping buffer flow, you can get some additional settling. Again, those of you that have packed silica or controlled pore glass or zirconium are familiar with this phenomenon. It's natural. Um, as I said, it can occur from column tra transport from one room to another or one building to another. If you need to, lower the flow adapter further to minimize this additional headspace. And think about incorporating this into a packing procedure. Um, you can discuss this further with your local process specialist. If you allow the manufacturing floor to further lower the headspace as CHT is settling, you can avoid some deviations and probably a lot of headaches. So now I want to talk about some of the optimization studies that we've done on CHT to see exactly what things can affect column performance in terms of HETP and asymmetry. And this next slide, I hope, is in fact going to convince you the next two slides that CHT is the easiest resin to pack. So we looked at, uh, we did about 28, maybe a few more actually, independent packing cycles. And this list, which I'm not going to read to you, are all the things that we looked at varying. So um, in a simple case, which you'll see in a minute, we kept everything the same just to see how reproducible we could be. And then one at a time, we varied these additional items and then checked asymmetry and HTTP to see what, if any, effect they would have. Okay, so this next slide is a summary of all of those things. Um, and we have roughly divided this into three groups. And again, I want to stress these boxes, green, yellow, and red, are our attempt to break this into segments. It may be that red is perfectly fine for you. Having said that, these were values that many people would consider to be quite good and lots of points are in this area. There were only a few experiments we did where we deviated from this. In the yellow, you see two conditions. One is where we simply dumped the spray into the column, let it settle overnight by itself, came in the next morning, dropped the head, the top flow adapter down and tested. And you see, we get values that aren't really too bad, right, in a symmetry of 1.5 to 1.7 and 8,000 to 9,000 plates per meter. That's not a bad pack for most people. So you could even take CHT, dump it in, go out, go home if you're tired, go out for a tea break if you want, pastries, come back in, you're good to go. The only other way that we were able to get values in this yellow box is if we left a headspace of about 10 millimeters. Now you recall I said that we typically like to leave one to five millimeters Somewhere in this box are one millimeter and five millimeter. It doesn't make much difference. 10 millimeters, you start to see a fall off in HETP, not necessarily asymmetry too bad. The worst case we were able to get was only leaving a 20 millimeter headspace. This is two centimeters. So, and again, even these values may be acceptable. If you're doing a step elution, you only need one plate per meter. And asymmetry doesn't really matter, except maybe in terms of elution volume if it's a true on-off binding. So even this might be acceptable to you. When people ask me, I want to validate different packings for CHT to see what ranges of HETP and asymmetry are acceptable, I say, the only way you're going to get something really bad is to do something like this. We just don't know of any other way that you can, that you can um, purposely get a bad CHT packing. And I should say that we have packed columns now up to 1.8 meters with CHT, and it doesn't seem to matter what column size we pick. The values you get are pretty much always in this range. For more information, um, you can look at our, our online packing videos. You can contact technical or ap application support. Here are the various ways to contact them, and if they don't know the answer, they'll contact me and I can talk to you directly. If you want to get resin samples, you can go to this URL and request samples or additional online resources. 
you go to biorad.com, we have a lot of uh, online brochures and guides for using CHC and all of our other resins. And for industry events where we're going to be presenting, you can go to this URL. Okay. So it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, is the tap settled density calculated as an average or does it vary per lot? So that's a great question. The tap settled density can vary slightly per lot, but, but not very much. Having said that, the, the people that use 0 0.60 seem to come up with just about the, the exact bed volume that they were looking for. <clears throat> okay. If you want, if you want more information about that, you know, please feel free to contact your local specialist or or tech support. And what is the largest diameter column that has been successfully packed? Right. So the largest diameter column that's been successfully packed. Well, all diameter columns have been successfully packed. The largest one we've ever packed, I actually I actually assisted with last year in Europe, and it was 1.8 meters. A stainless steel 1.8 meter column. What is the recommended slurry concentration? Right. So we looked at on that slide with the with the the red, green, and yellow. We looked at a variety of slurry concentrations. Um, I like to use 40 percent. That seems to be a nice trade-off between uh, not having too dense a slurry and not needing too large a slurry tank. If you're going to transfer by a diaphragm pump, if, if you're going to, sorry, if you're going to do a stall packing, which I haven't talked about, you may want a, a thinner slurry, but, but I would say anywhere between 30 and 40 percent is good. So what this means is that you're going to need a column tube that's at least twice the working volume of your final bed. Right? So if you're going to pack a 20 centimeter tall column, you need a working bed volume of let's say at least 50 centimeters. Okay. And as far as an unpacking procedure, is, is repacking possible? So repacking is possible. Um, again, that's, we, we have videos, I think, on our YouTube channel that show that, and so I would, I would direct you there. And I think if you look online or, again, call your local process specialist, they can give you the URL to that video link. It's actually a very nice video. And I think this will be the last question just for the sake of time. What is the best technique and measurement for leveling the column? Ah, <clears throat> so, well, the best technique is essentially to use a construction level, you know, one of those glass bubble levels. Make sure you have it on you put it on a, on a part of the column that you know is flat to begin with, and that's usually the top of the top flange. And make sure you, you, you level it, you put the level at the perpendicular position. So put it on the top of the column in some, in some orientation, and then make sure you go 90 degrees to that to check for column leveling in the X as well as the Y axis. You know, in terms of how level does it have to be, you know, again, it, it depends. If you're going to leave a five centimeter gap, obviously you could have the column be a little less level than if you leave a one centimeter gap. And I go back to what I said before. If, if the column is slightly unlevel and you break one or two beads, okay, that's not a problem. The more beads you make, break, the bigger the problem is. So just try to get the column as level as possible. That's, that's usually not a problem because, because most manufacturing floors are set up to start out with level columns anyway. But it's, it's something you do want to watch out for. Okay. Well, and if we didn't get to your question in this Q&A, um, we will be passing these questions along to Mark. He'll have your email contact and can follow up with you. So thank you very much, Mark. You're very welcome. Thank you all for joining in at, at whatever hour of the day or night it happens to be. Yes. Uh, if you and have any other questions, let, yes, let us know. In fact, Lee, Lee before we off, let me, let me add mm -hmm. one thing to that. If you have questions, okay. please ask us. We're here to help. And if you don't ask, we can't help. Um, and we'd hate to see, all manufacturers would hate to see you not use a product or have bad results just because you didn't ask a question that maybe we could help you with. So what we're here for, 
If nobody asks a question to me, then I'm out of a job, so please help me keep my job. <laughs> there you go. Okay, and just to remind you everyone, the recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link and with this follow-up information you see on the screen here. So we look forward to having you join us at our future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Thank you, and have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.